Okay. Uh, welcome to this final concluding session of the Progressive Governance Conference. We have five excellent panelists. They include two former prime ministers and one or more potential ones. <laughs> and I shall certainly not reveal who I have in mind. Uh, the organizers of the conference have invited us to reflect on a single but extremely important question, namely, does social democracy have a distinctive international agenda? And I shall take the liberty to add one word to that question, namely the word European. Does social democracy have a distinctive European and international agenda? I think the explanation is pretty straightforward. It's not only because we are in Europe and most of us are Europeans, but also because after so many years of European integration, there is a distinction between the European and the international, both in terms of what is policy desirable, but even more so in terms of what is politically feasible. So this is the question I put to our panelists. Does social democracy have a distinctive European and international agenda? And I also propose to present to you a set, a subset of four questions that come under the general theme. The four questions go as follows. The first one, of course, we are going through a pretty dramatic and rapid shift in the international balance of power from a unipolar to a multipolar world. And it's going to be also a world which is less Western dominated than has been for more than two centuries. Uh, such shifts in the international balance of power, history teaches us, do not, are not always terribly smooth, and this is to put it mildly. And there are also many trouble spots in the world. There are threats, and there are failed or potential failed states. Now, the center left has traditionally been relatively comfortable with the exercise of soft power it feels more awkward with the exercise of hard power. So one first question is, is there a distinctive center-left approach, especially to the exercise of hard power, and especially with reference to failed states? We have had quite a few in the past, and we're going to have probably even more in the future. So what are the prospects for humanitarian intervention in a difficult world? So that's the first question. The second question goes as follows. I think for many years, some in the center left and more outside it have tended to confuse economic liberalism with casino capitalism. And we have ended up with the latter rather than the former. Now we seem to be wiser after the event. The question that I would like to put forward to you is, does the center-left have a distinctive approach, agenda, on how to regulate and tax the financial industry? And this is, I think, a particularly relevant question because this is by far the most globalized sector of the world economy. So national solutions in terms of regulation and taxation of finance have very narrow limitations. So what can we do? at the European level, and what can we do at the international level? Now, the third and fourth questions are more directly European. Uh, for years, I used to worry, personally at least, that Europe was becoming too much identified with economic liberalization, while redistribution and welfare were the exclusive domain of the nation state. And I thought, and I was not the only one to think that, that the combination was not politically sustainable in the long run. Now, because of the crisis, the situation has changed and it has become more complicated and certainly more threatening because in the economic center of Europe, we have the specter of a transfer union as it is perceived in countries such as Germany, Austria, and Finland, and the others. A specter of a, of a transfer union in which the countries of the economic center will be bailing out the heavily indebted countries of the south. 
and the West. And then in the economic periphery of Europe, it's a different problem, is that Europe is increasingly being identified as the policeman of austerity. Now, the combination of the two, I fear, can be political suicide for Europe. Does the center left have any idea as to how to transform European integration once again into a positive sum game or not? And then my final question is that I fear that Europe runs the risk of becoming the victim of complexity in times when mass politics is turning increasingly populist and in the form of simple messages. Does the center left have a way of articulating a new political message that has a strong European and global component and can be not only articulated but communicated to the wider public? I fear that the European narrative or the European narrative that we have been using for years is becoming increasingly stale and boring. Do we have a more interesting narrative to address to the public? So these are the four questions I would like to address to our panelists. Let me start with the only lady in the panel, Helen Clark. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my comments will be from a, a development perspective. I want to start by saying that a progressive agenda, of course, has to encompass a vision for a world beyond uh, one's uh, borders. And I would say uh, to Europe, that means uh, beyond the borders of Europe as well, because I think there's been a perception in the larger world uh, that for some years Europe has been pretty w well turned in on its own issues and problems and not as, as outward looking and engaged as perhaps it could be. Uh, so when I talk about progressives looking beyond their own borders, I'm not just thinking nation state, but beyond uh, a, a, an agglomeration of states uh, such as Europe represents as well. But it seems to me that the social democratic movement really had its birth in internationalism. And if there's anything that should define us in the 21st century, when we're crying out for international multilateral solutions, it should be internationalism, multilateralism. We should be seen as leaders in this. And leaders with a cause and a passion for greater equality in our world. And I'll come uh, back to, to that. Now, times of crisis uh, should be times for multilateralism, uh, in theory. Uh, just as at home they should be times for social democracy because social democrats uh, and governments are more likely to look after people uh, than, than governments of the right. But just as we find uh, that times of crisis uh, have tended uh, to be uh, better in some respects for conservative political forces and domestic politics, so also times of crisis induce that fear and that tendency to look inwards that we see in, in many countries, uh, not least in, in Europe uh, today. We see it on trade issues. We see it on migration uh, issues. And we've also seen, I think, times of crisis and fiscal constraint uh, bring a, a rather harder uh, line towards development assistance as well. Uh, for a start, the, the doubters and the skeptics that a cent of uh, foreign aid ever did uh, a, a bit of good, uh, they're out there with full voice uh, at the current time. Uh, we see it in the demand for results, uh, when actually the really worthwhile outcomes of development assistance uh, take uh, years to get. It doesn't uh, take five minutes to build the capacity uh, for a country to drive and fund its own development. These are long-term results, and they tend to defy uh, as any kind of instant matrix uh, that you try to put around it. And we're also seeing rather a narrowing of focus uh, by the traditional uh, Western donor uh, community uh, to the fragile states, uh, perhaps because they see a security threat uh, coming out of uh, the fragile states. And this is affecting even the broader range of least developed and low-income countries now who don't command so much attention. I raise this point uh, relating to what our chair said about the changing geopolitics, because there are many other actors in development assistance now, apart from the traditional Western uh, donors. There's the role, uh, particularly, of the large uh, emerging economies of the global south, uh, who, uh, of course, uh, uh, do not impose the, the kind of conditionality that is often uh, balked at uh, 
uh, that, uh, that Western countries can be associated with in development. So this is making for a very, very interesting uh, development landscape. So I think for progressives, the critical thing is to convey uh, to the people we're appealing to and representing that we are all in this together, you know, one planet, one set of natural resources, a planet that's under considerable stress. Just talking with uh, Jonas before this session, he's been in the Arctic in Greenland and hearing the, the, uh, the ice literally cracking close to you reminds you uh, how, how stressed our planet is. Uh, secondly, I think as progressives, we need a development agenda which is coherent. That means it's not enough just to commit to official development uh, assistance. Uh, that's important, but it's insufficient. The rules of the game need to change if we're genuinely interested in issues of equality which go beyond our own nation's borders. We need a game change in the rules at Doha. And uh, uh, Pascal Lamy has talked at many meetings recently about how perilously poised the Doha round is, which would be a disaster uh, for developing countries if it goes down. We need the rules of the game to change around, uh, around climate. Uh, Again, if, if you're looking at what's impacting on developing countries these days, crises that they had no part of making, whether the global financial crisis of the North, uh, which percolated out to every corner of the world, uh, the climate uh, crisis, which wasn't caused by LDCs, but they're on the receiving end of the worst effects of droughts, floods, uh, cyclones, uh, etc. Uh, we need rules of the game which will support countries to be able to adapt to this and to pursue a cleaner path to development uh, than the uh, industrialized North did on its way through. And then the third set of, of, uh, of rules of the game, if you like, I think are on migration, one of the toughest issues for Western countries to tackle because with this looking inwards, uh, uh, populations tend to, to blame the outsider uh, for the problems, and yet the Global Human Development Report UNDP produced about 18 months ago on migration was very clear that there are significant human development benefits to be gained both by host countries and source countries if the rules around migration are orderly uh, and, and well managed. Uh, my final point uh, would be in this agenda, uh, if we believe we've got a shared future and a common future, and major international reports have been written about this in the past two decades, then it, it's not good enough to live behind walls of privilege uh, ourselves. Uh, others will always look to break down walls of privilege. Uh, we become less secure if we live in highly unequal uh, worlds. Uh, obviously, the rich have got richer, the very rich have got very rich, in many uh, countries. And in developing countries, we've seen so often what look like great rates, rates of headline growth, but they don't often result in poverty reduction and in reduction in inequality. In fact, even where poverty has fallen, uh, inequality tends to rise uh, the way economies are structured. And this is very undermining of social cohesion and stability as it is in in Western societies, and I think part of the debate we need to engage in is what is that social contract which will guarantee the social cohesion and stability for orderly development in any society? Uh, how do we guarantee those minimum standards of well-being and equality of opportunity, not just in the West, but in developing countries as well? So those are some of the issues I'd like to put on the table for the discussion. Thank you very much. Now, Paul Rasmussen, as you know, he's not only the president of European Socialists, but also has been, had been for years prime minister of Denmark. The political situation in Denmark is rather tense or difficult, shall we put it this way. So he may have to leave before the end of the session, and he apologizes. But before that, he takes the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon, friends. The most difficult thing <laughs> It's not to be honest when we talk about our opposition, the conservatives. The most difficult thing is to be honest about, about ourselves, right? I think it's, it's necessary also when it comes to that last question because that is a precondition that we can find our way. So forgive me if I'm saying a couple of things which you may not like in the beginning, uh, but maybe hopefully in the second round you do. First, 
post-crisis agenda. Post for who? Well, it's post for the financial market. They are having a headline now called Babu, back to business as usual, right? But is it post for people? Is it post for our society? Is it post for the vulnerable groups? Is it post for the poor countries? It's not. So, please, we're in a crisis, okay? Second point. We are in a crisis, but not only that. We are in the middle of a deadly cocktail of globalization, as Pascal Lamy mentioned, and the crisis. And you see, this combination of globalization, which have been with us for quite a long time, and the financial economic bubble and crisis is a deadly one for progressives. Why? Because we don't have any international regulation, dear friends. Because when we deregulated our financial regulation nationally, we did it as progressive with the hope to get something instead. But we didn't obtain that yet. Don't forget that. Second point is, as Pascal indicated, maybe too many of us, including myself, were saying, hooray, globalization, welcome. This is the optimal work sharing globally, and that will give us unlimited wealth and richness. Well, it did, but the problem was, it wasn't distributed in the way people would expect it to be, and some one were losers and other were winners. And maybe a growing part of our electorate were the losers. Uh, those who didn't have all the best education, who couldn't manage all the best languages, and who couldn't see themselves in that new perspective. So, the cocktail, that's my second point, the cocktail of the globalization and the financial crisis was deadly as far as progressive answers. Why? Because people certainly could not see the answer to the following question, which everyone th think about. How can I get control on my life in a world out of control? Effects, apathy, fear, and consequence, thinking of myself. I mean, if I can't count on governments anymore, I have to think on myself, and who's promising me lower taxes and cuts? That's the conservatives. I have to live with them. But don't misunderstand this reaction. They are all out there, our people. Either they are sitting on the sofa and not participating in the elections, or they are telling us, come and get me if you can present a new vision, a new hope, and a new reality to us. What's that? Well, I think, number one, that we as progressives have to do an extra effort in Europe, as you said so wisely, Chair. We are inviting from the PS, the European Social Democratic Parties, to a new convention, which is finding place on the 25th and 26th of November in Brussels. We hope to gather more than 1,000 people from around the world. And the idea there is to define the role for Europe in the future, but also doing it together with the international institutions, talents, and others' institutions. Because there, I think, we need to understand that the character of our problems are per definition of such a kind that it can only be solved in our way if we do it with international institutions, Europe and globalize. Take it to handle the jobs and the growth. Nobody can do that alone. We need to do it together in Europe and globally. Debt, look at George. Nobody can handle the debt in an acceptable way if we don't do it collectively. Uh, take, take finance. No one can handle the speculation attacks on our governments if we don't do that collectively. Can I tell you, George didn't. Four hedge funds, four hedge funds, less than a handful of hedge funds, managed to speculate against state bonds from Greece, not that they didn't make mistakes in the past, that's not my point, but they managed to push up the interest rate payment more than plus extra 5% point. Now, the actual rate of around 13, 14% on a state bond in Greece is not corresponding to the capability of that economy, you see. And, and this is simply not manageable if we don't stand together. So, that's where Europe comes in. We, we, you know the term, too big to fail, right? We are talking about the banks, they're too big to fail, so we need to bail them out. I'm introducing a new term to you. We need to be so strong together that we are too big to fail from the perspective of the financial market, you see, so that they can no longer hope that they can, they can kill us separately or splitting us separately, because if we develop a new strategy, 
which is too big to fail. For even the biggest hedge fund, even the biggest amount of hedge funds who want to make us failing, if they begin to believe, oh my God, now they are too big to fail. You see, this is essential, essential to understand what we need now. How do we do it? Let me make four points. One, economic governance. As everybody has said until now, the problem with Europe is not the European Union, the European Monetary Union. The problem is not the Euro. The problem is that we are missing economic governance. Aren't we having economic governance now? Yes, we are having the Angela Merkel way and the Sarkozy way, but this is not true economic governance. This is in the governmental, let's say what can be saved, but often they come too hesitant and too late, and who's paying the prices, you know. We need a true economic governance in Europe. And, and, and my proposal is not to have a new treaty because, you know, I've had six referendums in my country. Ooh. I have won four and lost two. That's not bad, but you know, <laughs> take too long time. So we need to do something before we can have a new treaty, right? So my proposal is that we in Europe try to implement a coordinated economic political common action a progressive, coordinated, economic, political, common action. We have in the PES presented a plan of macroeconomic coordination which shows us that in the next five years, if we agree on such a coordinated investment approach, we can create eight million more jobs in five years' term compared to the conservative austerity plans. I'm not saying we shouldn't make cuts. We have to. And I'm not saying we shouldn't make reforms on the supply side. We have to. I'm saying that we need to do it with a progressive uh, vision and a progressive way of doing things. If we combine reform with a coordinated investment action using our economic interdependence, we can have 8 million more jobs in five years compared to the conservative approach. And we can have, listen guys and friends, we can have a, as good public sound finance as the conservatives is propo are proposing, you see? So the difference is capacity use and jobs, not that they can present a better sound and pu better public finances, we can do the same. That's one more difference. In their perspective, there'll be unemployment of around 11.5% in Europe if we just follow their roadmap now. Conclusion, Europe is in the wrong hands. <laughs> majority, majority of Europe is conservative governments and that's what you see right now, whether you ask Wayne from UK, who's here, or you ask all of us, Germany and France, don't forget that for one second. Second point is debt. We cannot handle debt in Europe without doing it together. It's impossible. If you go into it as an economist, which I am, you will reach the conclusion that the price to handle debt individually and vulnerably to the financial speculation attacks you have will be so high that the consequences of lacking economic governance and lacking handling of debt, you know what that will be? That will be that all our progressive dreams of having a Europe where you have convergence among member countries at an even higher level year by year, that dream will not be there anymore. So what you will see if the conservative approach is, is pursuing will be, yes, Germany will be good and will have a great success, maybe France, but you will see a spread in Europe where the poorer member countries will be poorer and the richer ones will be richer and the spread will be negative. That's my point. And that's to underline to you what is at stake. How do we do that? Eurobonds is the way to do partwise of it. Paul, that's wrong. No, it's not wrong. Do you know, friends, that the European Central Bank, I would never have believed that. One year ago, Trichy said, we will never, ever buy national sovereign bonds. That's not allowed. We will never do that in the European Central Bank. You know what they're doing now? They're having more than 60% of these sovereign bonds. So tell me how and why we shouldn't release the European Central Bank from that obligation because it's not sustainable in the long run and introducing euro bonds to be too big to fail. You see, if we can transform part of the national debt, which was the consequence of the financial crisis, to a euro bond market, even the best speculators will say, well, they are too big to fail. We have to accept a lower price to buy these bonds. Very last point, financial regulation. 
can I appeal to all progressives to make one decision in principle? I'm convinced we can do it. I've heard so many times the smart guys in London City saying to any government in London, if you regulate us, we will flee to Wall Street, right? And I've heard so many times in Wall Street saying to Obama, if you regulate us, we will flee to London City, right? And the German guys in Frankfurt are saying exactly the same. They, will flee, they can flee two ways, can't they? My point is, we need to be robust now. We need to introduce a, a better financial regulation. And we need to do it even in countries where we know that, that there are guys who earn quite a lot of money through our system. But, but when the leader of the financial authority is saying that part of it is social useless, this is the guy sitting in the top of financial authorities in London City. And when even Warren Buffett is talking about financial weapons of mass destructions, it's not me, I could have said it, but it was him who said that, right? Then we need to understand this is feasible. And I tell you, we will not get a progressive society development without having a better financial regulation and without having a financial transaction tax. And Europe can start on that financial transaction tax. That's my last point, and I'll, I'll be short to you. Those who say it's impossible to introduce a financial transaction tax if we don't do it globally, those are the ones who think it will never be. There will always be a Cayman Island. There will always be a third place where you can place yourself. I'm saying, let's start in Europe. This is the biggest economy in the world, and they will not flee away. We have made calculations showing, the feasibility study showing that even if you introduce a financial transaction tax of 0.05%, and you compare Europe, including the financial transaction tax, with the rest of the world, excluding financial transaction tax, and you measure, will the financial markets players earn money in Europe? I tell you, they will still earn money in Europe. I was talking with the biggest private equity manager in the United States at a meeting we had recently, uh, Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts. And uh, during that speak, he said, Paul, it's even possible to earn money in France, he said. <laughs> right? So, of course, we can do it, but we have to do it together. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's one conclusion to draw is that being honest can also be progressive. Okay, thank you. So Marco Aurelio Garcia from Brazil, he will speak in Spanish and there will be interpretation into English. Pleased to have you here. Well, bueno, voy a hablar en español porque yo aprecio mucho la lengua inglesa. <laughs> I will speak in Spanish because I do appreciate very highly the English language. Yo quisiera en primer lugar agradecer a la invitación y decirles que ningún lugar en Europa me parece más adecuado para una reunión de la gobernanza progresista que Noruega. Así que tengo mucho gusto de estar acá. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation and say that I do not feel that there's any place in Europe that would be more suitable for hosting this conference than Norway. So it's a pleasure to be here. Nosotros tenemos aquí que discutir temas internacionales, pero yo creo que es muy difícil discutir una política externa sin hacer una cierta mención a aspectos internos de los países que implementan esa política externa. We're here to discuss international topics, but I find it very difficult to discuss foreign policy without mentioning internal aspects that heavily influence the situation of those countries that are to carry out that foreign policy. Brazil ganó una presencia fuerte en los últimos años en el ámbito internacional, y creo que más allá de los aciertos o errores de su política externa, Lo que contó mucho fueron las transformaciones que nosotros hicimos en el interior del país. Brasil ha ganado una muy fuerte presencia en la arena internacional en los últimos años. Y más allá de los fracasos o los errores que podríamos haber hecho en nuestra política foreign policy, 
I think the important aspect to underline here is the internal transformations we've carried out. Nosotros ingresamos en un nuevo periodo de crecimiento económico después de 25 años de estancamiento. We entered into a new period of economic growth after 25 years of economic standstill. Pero hicimos ese crecimiento fundamentalmente a partir de una política de redistribución de ingreso y de inclusión social. The growth came basically because of the policies of in redistribution of income and social justice. Ustedes conocen seguramente algunos de esos elementos. 15 millones de nuevos empleos. I'm sure you know some of the, these elements, 15 million new jobs. 30 millones de personas que salen de la pobreza y pasan a la clase media. 30 million people who came out of, were lifted out of poverty and into the middle class. Aumentos de los salarios y sueldos por encima de la inflación. Pay raises and wage raises that were in excess of the inflation rate. Y eso todo sin comprometer ni el equilibrio macroeconómico y con fuerte reducción de la vulnerabilidad externa del país. Brasil dejó de ser deudor internacional y pasó a ser acreedor. And this without compromising the macroeconomic structures and Brazil passed from being a debt, indebted country to a country that could offer credits to others. Pero yo les garantizo que lo que a nosotros más nos enorgullece es el hecho que conseguimos hacer esas transformaciones en, con profundización de la democracia en el país. And I can assure you that what makes us most proud of this entire process is that we were able to carry out these transformations and at the same time enlarge and make deeper our democracy. Eso nos ha permitido, obviamente, no solo tener una inserción internacional más fuerte, sino que vencer concretamente la situación de crisis que después del, del 2008 se abatió sobre el mundo. That has allowed us not only to t find our place internationally in the economic uh, structures, but it's also allowed us to overcome the crisis that hit the world and our country very hard after 2008. Brazil fue el último país a entrar en la crisis y uno de los primeros a salir de ella. Brazil was one of the last countries uh, that entered into the crisis and we were one of the first to emerge from it porque políticas que podrían ser caracterizadas como políticas socialdemócratas nos permitieron crear un gran mercado de consumo interno, que fue justamente lo que garantizó la vitalidad y la, el dinamismo de la economía. Because policies that could be characterized as social democratic policies were precisely those that enabled us to create a large internal demand, increased consumption, and increased dynamism in the market. Llego al último aspecto que me gustaría poner en evidencia. There is a last aspect I would like to draw your attention to. Que es nuestra inserción internacional. And that's the role we're playing at the international level. Nosotros tenemos la firme percepción que estamos marchando hacia un mundo multipolar. We are firmly convinced that we are heading towards a multipolar world. En el cual existen y probablemente existirán durante un largo periodo asimetrías. In which there already exist and probably will exist for a long time to come, it will be an asymmetrical world. La pregunta que se plantea entonces es de saber si nosotros queremos en cuanto Brasil estar solos como un polo o si queremos organizar otras fuerzas para garantizar una presencia más consistente en el mundo multipolar. So the question that we have to put ourselves, put to ourselves as Brazil is if we want to get this alone or whether we want to organize with other forces so that we can pass uh, or make the transition into a multipolar world. E hicimos la segunda opción. We've gone for the second option. Nosotros queremos tener una evolución conjunta con América del Sur. We want to evolve together with South America. Y fortalecer las políticas sur-sur and strengthen South-South policies. Que tienen varias expresiones orgánicas. Una de ellas, obviamente, son los BRIC. 
this South-South relationship has several organizational expressions, one of them being the BRIC. América del Sur es importante por varias razones. South America is important for several reasons. No solo por el peso de su, por su potencial energético, por el peso de sus materias primas, por su gran capacidad de producción de alimentos. Not only because of its weight in the world economy or uh, because of its potential as a food producer or as a raw materials producer. También por razones de naturaleza, por así decirlo, y material. It's also important because of reasons that we could call immaterial. Es una región democrática. It's a democratic region. Es una región que no tiene conflictos de fronteras, conflictos religiosos, conflictos étnicos. It's a region that does not have border conflicts, religious or ethnic conflicts. Y todo eso son factores que ayudan muchísimo, digamos, en un tipo novedoso de inserción internacional. And these are factors that are extremely helpful in a new type of international insertion. Para concluir, yo quisiera llamar la atención para algunos aspectos internacionales que nos preocupan mucho. By way of conclusion, I would like to draw your attention to some in aspects, international aspects that we're deeply concerned over. In primer lugar, que tenemos un orden mundial que corresponde a 60 años y, por lo tanto, tiene muy poco que ver con el mundo del siglo XXI. First of all, we have an international order that corresponds to the situation 60 years ago and consequently it has very little to do with the world in this century. Eso es verdadero para las organizaciones de Bretton Woods. It is an order that came out of the, of the Bretton Woods Accords. Pero también lo es para Naciones Unidas y en especial para su Consejo de Seguridad. But it's also a statement that applies to the United Nations and in particular to the Security Council. Esa inadecuación explica una serie de fenómenos que hemos discutido acá y, y discutimos todo el tiempo en foros semejantes. And this inadequacy explains several of the phenomena that we have heard uh, mentioned today. Y que estuvieron muchos de ellos en el origen de la crisis del 2008. And these were also factors that played a very important role in the emergence of the financial crisis in 2008. Yo tengo dificultad de hablar de post-crisis porque creo que estamos metidos en ella todavía. I have difficulties in talking about a post-crisis situation because I do believe we're still in the crisis. Anarquía financiera, ausencia de regulación. Financial anarchy, lack of regulation. Políticas nacionales que se imponen al orden global como la política monetaria de Estados Unidos, para citar un ejemplo, o la política cambiaria de China. Um, these, we are in a situation in which national policies are being imposed on the global order. By way of example, I could mention the United States monetary policies or China's different policies. Y una fuertísima tentación proteccionista que se ve en muchos países. And a very strong temptation towards protectionism that we observe in several countries. Una última palabra sobre Europa. I would like to say a few closing remarks on Europe. Todos saben las relaciones históricas que hay entre América del Sur y Europa, y Brasil y Europa. I think you all know of the historic ties between South America and Europe, between Brazil and Europe. Nosotros no somos, por lo tanto, indiferentes de lo que pasa en ese continente. Which means that we're not indifferent to what happens in Europe. Y lo que vemos es una gran ruptura de los lazos de solidaridad que debían dominar las relaciones en un proceso de integración tan avanzado como fue el proceso de la Unión Europea. And what we see is a break with these sol ties of solidarity, the principles of solidarity that should govern and has governed the very intense process of integration that the European Union represents. Eso tiene reflejos no solo en la política interna europea, sino que en la proyección de la política externa europea, si es que se puede hablar de una política externa europea propiamente dicha. This reflects not only on the internal policies and situation in the EU, but also on the external policies of the EU, if it then at all is possible to talk about a foreign policy of the EU. Bueno, veo que estoy hablando demasiado, así que quiero quedarme aquí en la provocación que hice al, al debate. 
Well, I see I've taken the floor for quite a long time, so I'll leave it here and then leave my little provocative words for you to ponder. Thank you. Our next speaker is Enrico Letta from the Italian Democratic Party, who I presume will concentrate on Europe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, of course, to Policy Network. It's always a very important opportunity for us. I don't want to speak about Italy, uh, even if today is the last day of, the, of an important electoral campaign. We will vote for, for local elections. So. I will try to catch in some minutes a plane, the last plane to arrive in Milan. We will vote in Milan. Milan is the headquarter, as you know, of our prime minister and uh, his football team too. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, will, I will try to, 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 to be there, to, to be there for conclude the electoral campaign this evening. Uh, we are a little bit confident. So uh, thank you very much. I, I will try to, to raise uh, four uh, cornerstones about the, 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 uh, the question that Lucas uh, asked to us. Uh, the, the first cornerstone is, is about demography. The second about uh, uh, economics. The third about politics. And the fourth about intergenerational uh, aspect of Europe. Very briefly, but the first one, demography. I think demography is, is the, the, the true threat for, for, for Europe. Uh, we are in a very difficult situation. Immigration, as you well know, is, is one of the, the, the most important uh, issues for all uh, the internal domestic agendas. But I would like just to remind you the essential figures of the migration problems uh, for, for Europe, because I, I think it's important. In the 70s, two millions of people arrived in Europe. In the 80s, four millions of people. In the 90s, nine million of people. And in the last decade, 15 millions of people. So in, in, in the last 20 years, we received 24 millions of people. That is enormous, because it's 10 times what happened uh, in, in the years before. And in the last decade, we overcome uh, the US, because the, the people arriving to the US in, uh, in the last decade uh, was no more than 12 millions of people. I think these figures are important to understand how the problem is big and how the way, the sudden way in which the problem arrived to Europe without the capability of the European Union to try to react, and to try to react uh, rapidly in, in, a, in a, a fast way. So we are now discussing, but the problem exploded just some years ago. So we have problems about uh, how to select arrivals, how to uh, have integration policies in the countries, how to have a commission ready to have this issue as one of the first issues. I never heard Mr. Barroso speaking in, in the last uh, uh, months about this subject as the main subject. Was way, always leaving to a commissioner, leaving to a general director of the subject, I think is not a way to try to uh, tackle with, with the main problem of our domestic agenda. Uh, just, just, for instance, our local electoral campaign today is dominated only by the immigration problem. Uh, always uh, discussing about this problem in different cities uh, and so on. So uh, this is the first problem linked to demography because, of course, um, demography is, is I, I think, the, 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 the main threat for, for Europe. Uh, we are countries, there are countries in which the Scandinavian, France, in which demography is less important as problem, but for the other countries, uh, I, I mentioned Italy, Spain, Germany, 
um, demography is, is, is one of the main problems. And I think we have to, to, to all together to try to, uh, to raise policies because uh, tackling this problem means uh, trying to have policies for the future. And if not, the future of Europe will be a marginal future. Also because the second uh, cornerstone, the, the economic point, uh, the, the economic corner point, uh, uh, cornerstones I, I would like to, to raise is linked to the fact that we, we built EMU, European Monetary Union. But uh, only the monetary union we did. The economic uh, union is always there waiting for our policies. And I think the Greek problem, the Irish problem, uh, is absolutely very linked to, the, to this uh, separation between monetary union and economic Union, monetary union, union with a big, big uh, capability to raise um, instruments, sanctions, uh, communitarian approach to the problem without the same capability to have economic uh, integration and economic policies. I think this is the main problem and linked to, the, to, to, to that what uh, uh, Paul uh, raised just some minutes before the problem of the debt at the European level. I, th I think it's impossible for any country to uh, manage the debt problem uh, alone. It's not just an Italian or a Belgian problem. I think it's a general problem because the debt uh, today is a problem also for other countries. And uh, how is possible to have uh, a national, just a national approach to this problem. We need to have discipline and European approach to the subject. And the third cornerstone is a, is a political one at the European level, because I think is not um, the crisis, the crisis of the Euro, the crisis of Greece, Ireland, the other countries, the difficulty of the European Union to, to, to build uh, a, a reaction is absolutely parallel with the crisis of the European Commission. I think we never had a worse uh, European Commission than the Commission we have today. With a lack of leadership, with a lack of vision, with the idea that the Commission is just a group of uh, uh, professionals. The Commission is the leadership, the European leadership. Without political vision, the Commission is not able to uh, manage the problems we have. Because all we ask to the Commission, to the Europe, to have answers, to have reactions, but how is it possible to have reactions uh, without a strong role of the Commission. The central bank did a wonderful job, in my view, in, in these two, three years. But instead of the Commission, in some way, the leadership was taken by the central bank, not by the Commission. I think it's a very crucial problem, and it's a political problem also for us, of course, because we we have to be more tough against the Commission in the European Parliament, in the political uh, uh, places in which we are able to do that, because with this kind of leadership of the Commission, of course, it's not a problem of, of the commissioners. The problem is the, the leadership of the Commission, in my view. Uh, with, with this idea, it, it's impossible to, to have answers. Uh, so my, my final point is about the intergenerational problem. Ed Miliband yesterday raised this problem uh, in, in a very correct way. I think is, is one of the main problems. Youth means future, 
And with that future, of course, it's impossible to imagine a progressive governance, a progressive policies. Uh, and we have to be the parties that the people can, can see as the parties of the futures, of the, of, the, of the youth, of the capability to give hopes to the, to the youth of our countries. Uh, that is not the case today. We have to focus about uh, answers, about policies, about the capability to have, uh, at the European level, some pragmatic answers. Um, Europe uh, gave pragmatic answers to the, to the youth some years ago. Ryanair is a pragmatic answer to the youth. Erasmus is a pragmatic, a very effective uh, answer to, to the youth. But today, what, what, what is, from, from a European perspective, the idea we have for helping, supporting the young people of our countries? I think this is the main point, maybe, uh, for us. And my conclusion is about uh, populism. We, 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 uh, Lucas raised this point at the beginning. I think is our enemy, is our enemy. The populism, and not only, this is also the Italian experience, not only the populism allied with the right-wing parties, with the conservative parties, but the populism is a virus, and the virus uh, is attacking all the political spectrum. And I think uh, our societies, our political system will uh, will will experience the 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 populism also on the left side, and it will be for us something of not very easy uh, to manage with. But the the true point, from my point of view, is to to be very uh, effective in our answers to, as I like to say. To, to be like uh, a Van Gogh paintings, uh, without nuance, strong, deep colors, uh, because we are too much nuance. Uh, and people today need to have clear responses. If not, the populist at right, at left, will be uh, the answer that, that people will, uh, will, uh, will reach. So I'm sure that uh, this idea of, of being maybe more tough, more uh, strong in our colors, in the colors of our responses, could be something of uh, uh, useful for us. I'm sure that uh, it would be useful also for Milan and for our elections Sunday. Thank you. You said that the centre-left has probably been a bit too nuancé in its response and its reaction to populism. I would probably add also too defensive, and that's even worse. Uh, last but not least in this first round is the foreign minister of our host country, Jonas Stoer. You have the floor. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for the, um, the, uh, the invitation. Um, I, I will try to respond to the question you asked me, but also comment on some of the, the previous speakers. Now, first, my, my first um, uh, reflection is a bit motivated from what I went through uh, over the last 24 hours. Helen referred to it. I'm coming back at 5 o'clock this morning from Greenland, where we had a meeting in the Arctic Council of Arctic States. And literally, as Helen said, in Greenland, you can hear global warming. You can hear global warming when the ice is cracking. And I'm coming back to think, you know, if there's one thing that we in the center-left must not drop it is the climate change issue. Because if we're gonna be faithful to our values and to our children and to our visions, we cannot simply drop the issue which is gonna determine living conditions. Jobs, economy, energy, everything. And that's about to happen now because you know this goes a bit like a roller coaster and climate ch uh, change issues, global warming is on its way down. But we from the Arctic family will provide new, very, very powerful evidence on what is going on, ranging from sea level rise 
to uh, you know other areas of um, intervention. Uh, black carbon uh, 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 particles suit landing on the white ice cover being a very powerful driver of uh, global warming, at the same time something we can do something about. My point is, as a movement, we have to analyze this phenomenon and come up with adequate policies and answers that we want to address it. To me, it matches the, cha the challenges of social democracy. On the one hand, the ability and readiness to analyze the real and the big issues as they are, and then try to draw the line to what it will take to come up with policies and practices that matter to people. I will be very frank now because, you know, I'll, I'll present my credentials. I strongly campaigned for Norwegian membership in the EU and I failed. So, uh, uh, Paul said he had fought six referendums, he had won four and lost two. I have actually only fought, uh, fought one and I lost. Uh, but having said that, I would like to say that as I observed as foreign minister since 2005, is Europe waning? When I travel around now at different meetings, I met Peter when he was commissioner for trade for the European Union in Hong Kong in 2005. Europe was at the square of, Europe, of global trade. Now, hard to be seen. When we did climate change progress leading up to Copenhagen, Europe was driving the agenda. Copenhagen, an illustration that Europe was basically being marginalized and now not to be seen. And in, in, in um, Enrico's intervention, you know, he made a lot of focus on the link between the Commission and the Parliament. Important issues, but does it matter to people? Do they understand the institutional implications for their daily lives and challenges? I wonder. And as I observe, you know, now the European Union, important institution, it is preoccupied with the process of digestion of its enlargement, of its currency, and of its treaty and more and more focused in on its own institutional discussions, building, on bil building a capacity for foreign policy while the expression of the foreign policy is not there present out there where the big battles are being fought. I'm worried about that. And what I also see is this European gloom about things. And you know, it has never been worse seen from your European perspective, but every statistic indicates that never in the history of man has so many people been optimistic about the future. But the difference is that they don't live here. So if you ask questions around Europe, do you look at the future with optimism? Majority say no. If you go everywhere else, you know, it's more tendency the other way. So we need to broaden that perspective. And I think, you know, now for our movement, we should also ask the following question on hist historic relevance. In 1914, people believed that the labor movement could block the war because we, the movement, would kind of see the the broader perspective would not be absorbed by nationalism and would obstruct to militarism leading to war. That didn't happen because the movements became very national and they were rallied for war. This is not the context today, but will we be able to maintain that perspective that we can understand the forces of globalization and produce policy answers to them and not succumb to petty populism and nationalism? I think that is a, is, is a big challenge. In terms of governance, again, as I see it, you talked about, uh, Lucas, that we are in a multipolar world. Yes, perhaps. But some also say that we are in a zero polar world because it is almost like the compass under the North Pole is going around. And it's not really G20, G8, but it's almost G0 in terms of having decisive powers at the global scene to deal with issues. Uh, uh, you know, uh, trade, there is not enough mobilized will to bring Doha to a conclusion. Climate, there seems to be weakening energy to bring climate, uh, uh, if not a big treaty, then a, a peaceful treaty. And surprisingly, we could mobilize decision making at the Security Council to intervene in Libya. But I wonder if there is enough organizational focus to end what started in Libya to mobilize you know, the political will to say, here is the, uh, the, 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 the map uh, for the, the follow-up. And that brings me to the question <laughs> on human uh, intervention. And, and my, my take on it would be the following. You asked the question, you know, is economic efficiency reserved for the right? No, it isn't. Sound <coughs> economic policies, and I work for a prime minister who is very much attached to that, is good center-left policy. It's being responsible. 
for a safe economy that can produ produce jobs and predictability for families. The difference here is that we also have a policy of redistribution and distribution and inclusion and empowerment. And that's where we differ from the right. Then, use of power intervention. Is that reserved for the Bush doctrine and for the right? No, it isn't. We also have to be ready for, you know, a military response. It should be based on Security Council resolutions within the realm of international law. But our answer does not stop at that. Because we will also include the broader perspectives of development, of governance, again, of empowerment to help those states build and move and develop. And that's where we're going to be challenged on Libya. That's where we're going to be challenged on other failed states, which I see as one of the prime threats to the global order, failed states. There will be more of them, and there are very serious threats coming out of them, ranging from terrorism to piracy, uh, environmental degradation, human degradation, uh, and so on. So I think that uh, on these issues, the challenge for us is to remain focused on that big picture, analyzing the real issues as they are and drawing the line all down to the families and the responses and explain uh, why, uh, we, why we act um, uh, as we do. And I think that, um, uh, I mean, nobody lived in the global. We all live local. And if our analysis um, end up to be global speak, that we speak about globalization in very abstract terms, which doesn't matter to jobs and family and lives and children and future, we will drift off to some kind of populism which will not matter to people. It is our ability to really deal with the real issues and explain how they are and address measures which can deal with them that, that, that we can prevail. And I see the challenge in Europe and Norway is integrated in this European economy, so they're not really a great difference, is that the European project is associated with austerity, is associated with macro issues pretty far away from daily lives of people, whereas the responsibility of dealing with those issues, doing the austerity measures, is on the national government. And that can create, I think, a very dangerous tension where you can have Euro blame on all these issues for populist forces around. And we should be a force uh, against that. Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about climate change, and I think there is no doubt that the two biggest market failures of the last two decades or so relate to the functioning of financial markets and also to global warming, because these are really huge market failures. And if the center left cannot have a solid and also collective response to those issues, it will not have a response to anything. But let me perhaps collect a few questions and then go to the second round. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Antonio Stella, Ideas Foundation from Spain. I have one comment and one question. The comment is uh, that um, of course, uh, in the European Union uh, has a monetary government, more or less. We as social democrats stand for an economic government. But I, di I didn't hear anything here about a social government, a social package. So I think that as progressives, we should go beyond the defense of an economic government for the European Union and fight for a social government, social package. And my question is, uh, if instead of having 20 conservative governments in the European Union uh, right now, we had had 20 social democratic governments, the measures in terms of the austerity measures that Europe has taken would have been different in terms of deficit uh, control and public debt control? Or there is not an alternative, there wouldn't have been an, an alternative plan for that uh, from social democracy? Thank you. Thank you very much. And then you. Okay, we'll reverse the order. My name is Philip Steinberg. I'm senior advisor of Sigmar Gabriel, the leader of the German SPD. I would like to, to come back to the title of this panel, and it asks, do we have a distinctive international agenda? I mean, we talked a lot about Europe, so the question also is, do we have a distinctive European agenda? And 
My answer would be, and I think that's what I, what I got from the panel, is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that we do definitely share common values. Yes, that we have a pro-European positive approach, even if we might not have actually left the crisis. No, however, maybe, or at least not as much as I would like it uh, to be, if we come to the substantive question and the answers to it. So I would like us to go this path, which actually was undertaken by Paul Rasmussen, to actually find answers to some of the pressing questions, I think, which are, can we actually agree on minimum corporate tax rates in Europe? Can we agree on the mentioned financial <coughs> transaction tax? Can we agree on a common consolidated tax base? What do we mean if we actually talk about European economic governance? I think these are questions we really need to find common answers as progressives in order to be able to be identified as a common, common movement. And, and there I think this is something we need, to, we need to come up with because if we don't manage to give people clear answers on these questions, what do we stand for as European, European progressives? I think it will be difficult to have more presidents here um, than we had um, yesterday and this, um, and this morning. And therefore, I think those are important questions we should actually try to answer in this difficult process. Paul Rasmussen has started to come up with this common basic program, this common principles. And I would strongly ask, like in line with the colleague who just spoke, spoke uh, before me, to that we, of course, need to find a social democratic answer to this question. If I speak about, if we speak about economic governance, of course, this includes the social question. Thank you very much. Before national politics succeeds in decimating completely our panel, let me give the floor to Enrico Letta because he has to catch a plane and then I'll come back. Just to, um, to, to raise one point, who was the guilty for the Irish collapse? Who was the guilty for the Greek collapse? Conservatives, populists. I think we have to be more self-confident in reacting to this populist and conservative alliance to say we are those who are able to give a future to the European integration. But um, I, I share your point. We need to be more, more, um, um, we, we need to discuss among us about the five priorities of a new deal for Europe. And we have to go out from the room when we, are, we agree about these five priorities. And we need to, to discuss for hours, for hours, and for hours. But, and one of these priorities, uh, of course, the idea which kind of society we would like to, uh, to, to create. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice trip back. Let me continue with the questions, and I'll give the floor to our panelists. <coughs> One comment and one question. Uh, having moved from a fast-growing, dynamic, large emerging economy, uh, namely India, to the EU, because I believed in the EU, uh, it's been very interesting to see the process unfold. Now, here's a group of countries with a shared history who know how horribly wrong things can go when you do not cooperate, as in the Second World War, who have a shared culture, shared economic interest, and repeat interaction so as to build trust. And based on what's been going on the past two years, if this is, have we hit the limits of cooperation? Have we hit the limits of what is possible to do even when it makes collective sense? And when we talk about the global issues, be it migration, be it climate change, financial issues, uh, managing health and germs transfer and information, it is important to keep the European lesson in mind because the EU has often been used as a model for what ought to be happening at a global stage. And between the rise in the size of externalities, the complexity of externalities, the speed at which things move, for example, just-in-time finance, it is important to question, have we hit the limits of what it is possible to do uh, together? And if yes, is it because the social democrats are out of power? Or is it something more fundamental? 
and there are things such as on climate change where we cannot but address the issue globally, trade where we need to continue to work at a global level, but certain other things such as finance where actually if we have hit the limits, the answers to the way forward in finance is maybe to roll back some of the cross-border stuff that we've reached. Uh, and we cannot on climate. We need to find the solution. But maybe. Well, you did indeed raise a fundamental question. Have we reached the limits of intergovernmental cooperation and integration? And if so, what are the policy consequences? Two more questions, and then I'll ask the panelists. Oh. The gentleman there, or oh, the lady, there was a lady there who raised the question. Hi, uh, oh. Francisco Diaz from Chile. Um, I, think, uh, I, think, I think we need more Europe down there in the south. Um, on, the, on the last two years or five years, the only thing we look from Europe is uh, Manchester United, Barcelona, and royal weddings. And I think that's not, not a good example, uh, good things that we need from you. Um, uh, we're more oriented to China and uh, the US, but basically China, and we are more concerned about uh, the, the, the model that we will sell our commodities to China, whether this is going to be a new dependency a model or, or a more uh, modern-oriented one. So we, we really need more Europe. So I would like if, if the panel, which is not very European at this moment, at this moment um, could expand on the five issues that the Italian colleague uh, said. The five issues, the five priorities like, that, that they can sell and, and to the rest of the world. But really, we need more Europe. Is she leaving also for good? Okay. Uh, from Romania. Uh, just a few comments, if I'm allowed. Uh, and the first one, I would like to mention that I'm making the comment more as an insolvency lawyer and somebody that spent a great amount of time studying for my PhD, the bank bankruptcy. And I do believe that the concept of too big to fail, it's a dangerous one. And it's a very dangerous one, it's been very discussed and it's been proven that uh, uh, when not dealt with this huge concept, uh, in a right way, in a proper way, it can be, uh, it can backfire. And I think, um, and I don't want to be understood, uh, misunderstood here, why uh, what uh, President Rasmussen was saying, yes, it's good, um, it could work, but uh, I think the, you know, the continuation of it is to put in place, uh, in place a proper mechanism on a sustainable one that will not give us a quick solution like in some of the European countries that recently faced the, you know, the, um, the crisis. Uh, just, to, and just not to have that reckless behavior that can be a very, very bad precedent and a very uh, quick fix, but not a long-term solution. And here, maybe the Central European Bank as was discussed here, they, uh, you know, it needs to be taken in cons into consideration this type of approach. The second one is the uh, union fiscal policy versus the monetary fiscal uh, policy. And I think that's been all addressed here. But uh, I'm not so sure I got the answer on a medium to long term basis. And I think it's up to us now to uh, leave the room or, uh, on a more uh, pragmatic approach and just find those answers that can be put in practice. Um, I'm not so sure that people um, are facing, uh, Europe generally is looking up to the relationship and, uh, with China and India. Because if we look especially what China is doing, is buying a lot of distress assets in, uh, in the countries that are having a lot of distress assets, and that's quite an interesting approach. And I'm not so sure that we as progressive are looking at this issue. And uh, lastly, and uh, the time is very uh, short, um, I've been hearing a lot about the migration. Yes, I understand that this is a serious issue with the developed countries. But um, for countries such as Romania, the newcomers into the EU, and as we are all talking about the solidarity, I think it's fair to put this, uh, the migration issue versus the immigration, because we don't have a migration issue, but we have a serious uh, brain drain. And uh, especially, like for example, in Romania, and I am the, um, we have like three, mi uh, out of 22 million people, we have three million living abroad. 
some of them very highly educated, uh, which is very good for your economies, but it's very bad for the Romania, uh, Romanian economy, for example, especially when you have six million um, pensioners and just four million active people. So um, those were my comments, and thank you. Thank you. So, you want to speak? Does it work? Yeah. I have a very short question to uh, the foreign minister of Norway. Is he glad in the end that Norway didn't join the European <laughs> Union? Um, in the light of his reflections about how the Union actually works, uh, how uh, inward looking it has become, uh, and how much energy it is eating uh, inside. Um, and wouldn't the Norwegian model not only be a very good model for the welfare state, but maybe also for Europe? Okay. I'll take no more questions, because if we continue like this, I will be the only one left on this side <laughs> of the table. <laughs> so, uh, let me ask our two remaining panelists to respond to questions. Perhaps one question I would address to Marco is, since uh, free capital movements and unregulated financial markets were the main vehicle of globalization for years, and since there are changes, both with respect to capital movements and perhaps also more with respect to financial markets, do you see a serious effect on the whole process of globalization? But also, bueno, yo creo que sí. Yes, I would say so. El gran problema que nosotros estamos enfrentando hoy día no es solamente del populismo que se ha mencionado acá. The great problem that we're facing is not only populism, as has been mentioned already. Es cierto que eso planteó para algunos países, para algunos partidos socialdemócratas, una, du una dura tarea, que es de limpiar la sociedad que dejaron gobiernos anteriores. And it's true that it is a very heavy task for some governments and so social democratic governments and parties to clean up this very heavy mess that was left. Y pagar el precio de esa limpieza. And also to pay the price for that cleanup. Pero no es menos cierto que algunos países están pagando un costo que siquiera fue producido en su interior. But it's no less true that some countries are paying a price for problems that were not caused by their internal situations. Por lo menos por sus gobiernos. At least not by their governments. Se podrá decir que esos gobiernos no fueran tan atentos cuanto debieran serlo. But it could be say that, said that maybe these govern, their governments were not as um, aware or as on top of things that they should have been. La crisis de Irlanda y la crisis de España porque aquí no se ha mencionado, es una crisis que se ubica centralmente en el sistema bancario. Because the crisis of Ireland and the Spanish crisis, which has not been mentioned that much today, is a crisis that sits squarely in the, at the center of the financial system. Y el virus que se introdujo en el sistema bancario español e irlandés vino de afuera. And the virus that hit the banking system came from abroad or from externally. Se podrá decir que los banqueros nacionales fueron, eh, tuvieron su participación, estuvieron de acuerdo con eso, fueron irresponsables. It could be said that the national bankers were of course also uh, responsible in the, in the sense that they acceded to this. Pero es evidente que ahí es un tema de la globalización financiera. But it's evident that this is a matter of global, global uh, financial globalization. Y que es un tema muy difícil que nosotros discutamos incluso en un organismo que debiera hacerlo, que es el G20. Which is the what? Que es el G20. And G20. it's also a topic that is not being discussed in a forum that should discuss it, which is the G20. Traten ustedes de plantear en el G20 el tema de la regulación financiera y verán cuál es la receptividad que ese tema tendrá, no será en todos los países, sobre todo en los más importantes. If you try to put on, uh, on the agenda the topic of uh, financial regula re regulations in that forum, you will see that the countries are very little interested in, uh, in discussing it. 
Especially the most important ones, the biggest ones. Como estamos chegando ao final, e creio que a última palavra deverá dar o ministro de Noruega, eu quisiera simplesmente chamar a atenção para duas coisas que me parecem importantes. And since this conference is drawing to close, I think it would be appropriate to leave the floor for the last word to the Foreign Minister of Norway, but I would like to raise two small issues with you before I do so. Y lamento que Leta no esté acá para que pudiera contestarlo. And I'm, and I'm very sorry that the other panelists have left so that they could not, cannot reply to those questions. Hay un problema demográfico? Sí, hay. That there is a democratic, the demographic problem? Yes, there is. El problema es si las formas que se están utilizando para resolverlo son las mejores. But the question is whether the approaches that are being used to solve these problems are the best approaches. La gente que ve los capitales circulando con toda tranquilidad se pregunta si las personas no pueden circular con la misma tranquilidad. People see capital circulating with the greatest ease and they ask themselves why can't people circulate with the same ease? Y además, si se quiere impedir una invasión bárbara de Europa, Europe, sería más útil que se tratara de resolver los problemas que están en origen del éxodo que hay de esas regiones hacia Europa. A more helpful approach would be to try to solve the problems that are, that are at the cause, at the origin, at the root of this exodus. Las alianzas que Europa tenía eran con el presidente de Tunisia, con el presidente de Egipto, con el presidente de Côte d'Ivoire y con todos, con tantos otros. Podría ser una lista interminable, muchos incluso miembros de la Internacional Socialista. European governments have had alliances with a series of countries and governments of Tunisia, of Côte d'Ivoire, of Egypt, and many of these governments were even members of, or the parties in power, were even members of the Socialist International. Yes. Thank you. Jonas, you have the last word. Thank you. Um, a very complex question being asked to me. I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it, you know, as easy as I can. My, my view uh, 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 was and is that um, Norway should belong in the political context where decisions are shaped and made. That motivates my position. Secondly, uh, a number of these issues that we confront require solutions among more than one. So we need to find together. But that being said, I think you know we should not become kind of Euro, Euro fantasists, not to criticize and observe what we see. And I think that you know it's going to be a growing challenge in this Europe struggling to keep our electorate informed that there is a close link between those who take the decisions and where they live. And if too many discussions are being absorbed far away, that's a threat to democracy. That, I think, is one worrying sign. The other one is that I strongly believe that the purpose of Europe being united is that Europe can have a voice which is heard and seen and making a difference. I see there's a struggle going on for that. And it is not happening as it should. And here I find that, you know, when I observe among my, my European colleagues that there is, a, there is a struggle for the soul. Where, as I see it, since I come from a small country, I'm not a member, that the bigger member states of the EU have great difficulties in accommodating the treaty they made, which is going to create common policies. They want both. So they are, on the one hand, creating a common policy tool, and they're doing their own things, where the medium and smaller countries are ready to pool resources around the common expression. I think that's bad, because it ends up, I mean, the world sees it. We can see it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I have to you. run. Thank you. you have to run. So, I. So, we are two of us. <laughs> so, perhaps let us end on a rather sobering note. And this is we are certainly not near the end of this crisis. And what is required to deal with it is really stretching the limits of cooperation and integration as we have known it until now. We are really at the threshold of integration and international cooperation, and it's not exactly clear what is lying behind. Now, having said that, let me invite the Vice President of the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, 
to make his concluding remarks. Thank you. Uh, in his uh, welcome speech yesterday, my colleague Roar Flåten underlined the timing of this conference. It is taking place just before the ETUC Congress in Athens next week and close up to important decisions being made in the European Union. But our perspective must be longer than this. It will take time to pre prepare the ground for a change to a better policy in each individual European country and for Europe as a whole. Our main message is that we need stronger institutions to balance the market and the impact of globalization. Markets are good friends for productivity and innovation. They are not, however, good friends when dealing with distribution and the need to include everyone in working life and society. And it's not the institution at the European level I have in mind here. Coming from a non-EU country, I am not in a position to talk about these. No, what we see is a lack of institutions at national level. Labor markets are not as globalized as some people like to believe they are, or indeed want them to be. We have seen the problems caused by an over-globalized financial markets. Financial institu institutions have been given too much power, too much money, and this in turn contracts the important goals of the social democratic policy. What politics deserves now are institutions working with them, not against them. The labor market sh should constitute constitute such supporters of progressive governance. But the labor market institutions need a sizable membership and political base in order to make constructive contributions to progressive governments. They need a minimum of political capital to make compromises in governing a country. I hope over Prime Minister Jens Stoltenberg has managed to explain to you how this pays off. And in this connection, I have to say, I am a little bit surprised. Yes, I admit, even disappointed, that the trade union movement's influence in the forming of politics and on developments in society has not been more strongly highlighted in many of the conference contributions. I will go as far as to claim that the very key to good policy making lies in tripartite cooperation built on a strong responsible trade union movement which is able to commit its members and has uh, control over wage, wage for formation through the process of collective bargaining. To strengthen the capacity of labor market institutions, we can start by reallocating some of the money and other measures of state support given to the financial sector. The financial sector in Norway is uh, exempted from paying value-added tax on services. Even with our relatively small financial sector, the value of this tax exemption has been estimated to about 25,000 euros per man year. Subsidies like this result in increases of incomes and jobs in this sector to unhealthy levels. And just one small example to further illustrate my point. In some countries, including Norway, trade union membership fees are deductible from tax. An example to follow. I will not even try to give an overview of the discussions and speeches made at this conference. What I would like to say is that it has hopefully provided great inspiration to overthinking both on the trade union side, in the parties, and also in the public debate here in Norway. I would like to thank all of you for participating in this conference, and I would like to give a special thanks to Policy Network and all the speakers, both those from the political arena and from the different research environments. I think it has been an interesting and varied program, and I hope that you, the audience, agree with me there. Once again, thank you for coming, and I wish you all a safe journey back home. Thank you. Especially remaining 
I would like to thank both the organizers and our hosts for excellent organization and a very generous hospitality. Thank you very much indeed.